everyone. Welcome to our Lifetime Value Roundtable. Thank you for joining us today on this Tuesday. Um, where we're sitting down with two of our closest partners, Triple Oil and Stay AI, for um, a panel discussion focused on tips and tricks that brands can use to increase lifetime value to build those strong customer relationships and you can yet at the end of the day uh, make more revenue for your business. So um, quickly to introduce our speakers, um, I'll hand it off to Erin. She's a tech partnership manager at Triple Whale. Erin, if you want to say a few words about yourself. Hello, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here with everyone today. I am very excited to share some insights and actual tips to help all of you create happy and those loyal customers for life without actually breaking the bank. Um, a little bit about me. So I currently live in Toronto with my husband and our beautiful dog. I am in New York City today. Um, but shout out to any of the fellow Canadians that are actually joining today's webinar. And about eight months ago, I was very lucky to join the Trip Whale family after working as a tech PM over at Gorgeous. Awesome. And we also have Gina Pirelli, the co-founder and CEO of Stay AI. Welcome, Gina. Hey, guys. I'm excited to be here today. Um, as they said, I'm one of the co-founders of Stay AI. I've been in their retention space for the last 10 years now. Um, prior to founding Stay, I founded an agency called Lunar Solar Group, where I ran our retention team there. So excited to chat with you all. Awesome. And yes, we have two Gina's on, on stage today. Um, I'll be your host, Gina Ellison, and I'm very excited to introduce Lindsay Danos, who is on my team here at ShipBob. Lindsay? Yeah, Lindsay Danos. I'm on the partner marketing team at ShipBob. I work really closely with all of our fun tech partners to put on cool webinars like this, and I'm really excited to learn from you guys today about different retention strategies brands can start implementing this year. Awesome. And I'm your host, Gina Ellison. I am based in Puerto Rico. I live here with my husband, my dog, Ellie, and my one-year-old daughter, Olivia, um, but born and raised in New York City. Um, so without further ado, let's kick it off. Um, this webinar, we're uh, ShipBob, hosted by ShipBob. Um, we help brands fulfill their everything orders everywhere their customers shop. So uh, fulfillment centers, 50 fulfillment centers around the world, um, one fulfillment platform, hundreds of sales channels um, and integrations, retail partnerships, um, and all the tools that you need fill seamlessly um, and for your customer shop. Here's one of the brands that we power. Um, awesome. And next we will introduce Triple Whale, one of our newest integration partners that like Yes. So for anyone unfamiliar with Triple Whale, Triple Whale helps brands operating at scale to collect attribute and also analyze data to make the right decisions at the right time. So basically we make it really, really easy to grow profitably by helping you understand who your customers are, where they came from, what they bought, and then of course, how much it actually costs to acquire them. Uh, today, Triple Whale is very proud to be the source of truth for 11,000 plus Shopify and Shopify plus stores. And those include Dose Lashes, Portland Leather, Avi, and Chamberlain Coffee to just name a few. Yes, and you guys have an awesome event coming up in New York City very soon. Um, so definitely stay tuned, Erin. I hope you'll share a little bit about that later on today. Um, and then we have Stay AI. Gina, do you want to give a little overview about what you guys do at Stay? Yeah, of course. Um, we are a subscription retention app for brands in the Shopify ecosystem. So if you're looking to take your subscription program to the next level, um, we specialize in giving you the ability to run A-B tests on seeing, you know, does a gift with purchase cut down and churn? And if somebody subscribed to product A, would they like, you know, take a cross sell to product B um, and a lot of different stuff like that. Amazing. And it's never been more important to drive those upsells. Um, awesome. Everyone, uh, Stay active in the chat, ha ask any questions that you might want of our panels. We will be pulling questions from there throughout. Um, 
And yeah, definitely take advantage of the knowledge that you have on screen today um, and don't be shy. Uh, so to kick off our, our panel today, um, you know, I'd really love to ask the group, uh, what is the biggest missed opportunity that you're seeing brands make uh, nowadays when it comes to increasing lifetime value? Um, and what's that number one tactic that you'd rep uh, recommend that brands implement today? We know that costs of acquisitions are going up, comp competition is rising, consumer spending um, has a lot of uncertainty around it. And of course, there's global supply chain challenges. So um, building those relationships are so important. Um, Gina, do you mind kicking it off? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, obviously, my go to for lifetime value is going to be a uh, subscription if your product catalog allows for it. Um, but outside of just turning on subscription, I mean, I think the best thing to do is really figure out based on your product catalog, do you have a gateway product? What are the different cross sells you can do? Leaning into email, SMS, some of these own channels to really make sure that if somebody is coming in on like, I always call it the gateway product. It's like what most of your customers will come in through. It's what you see probably the best um, way to acquire new customers is usually that one thing. Um, making sure that product customers get to shop around the product catalog, that they know that you offer more um, and doing a lot of different cross-selling and education around your brand. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I have so many subscriptions uh, running with my products. It just makes life easier as a mom, as a pet parent. Um, and I think it's one of the best tips uh, that brands can implement if they haven't already. Erin, how about you? What are you seeing on the triple oil side? Guys, honestly, I'm I'm on the tri the uh, subscription train as well, too. It's, it's just to really increase that lifetime value. I find that brands really they often prioritize acquiring new customers and then underestimate the potential revenue from existing ones. And really to enhance that customer retention is either through those loyalty programs and subscriptions, um, doing that like recurring revenue. Um, so for example, there is a new case study that we just came out with, with one of our health and wellness brands, Create, who was able to scale their business from zero to $4.5 million in just a year. And that was actually a big reason for emphasizing subscriptions. Um, so really their, their approach is to ensure continuous monetizations of customers over time um, and then just really moving beyond that one-time sales. And honestly, if anyone here is hesitant about adopting subscriptions, I just want to note that Create's revenue comes from, um, it's about half. So the revenue is about half of the revenue that comes from monthly subscriptions every month as well too. So yeah, also really big on the subscription for uh, uh, increasing lifetime value. Totally. Um, again, I couldn't agree more. Lindsay, what are you seeing on the fulfillment side? Yeah, I think that when it comes to like starting a new brand, um, something that is really easy to overlook is like not everyone's joining this business and is an e-commerce or like supply chain expert. And so it can be really easy to sort of overlook like how you're actually going to get your subscriptions delivered Um to your customers. Like we've all had that experience. I honestly just had it a few weeks ago of you find a cool new brand on Instagram, you want to buy from them, but you're sort of left in the dark. They don't have, you know, alerts. You don't know if your order's coming on time. You maybe selected standard shipping and that could be, you know, mean different things to different people. So really setting up like number one, a foundation for your supply chain to make sure that you can actually like continue to deliver a good experience for people who are interacting with your brand. So you place that order, you expect it to get there in two days and you don't want to pay $15 for two days shipping. Um, you can really talk um, like setting up your supply chain for success, whether you're a brand new brand brand or trying to scale, just making sure you can get your orders out to people, whether it is a subscription and it's coming every month at the same time, being able to stay flexible with those subscription options so that anytime someone is interacting with your brand, it's a positive experience. And they're like, wow, I love shopping with XYZ. Their onsite experience is amazing. Their subscription, I can stay flexible with it. I can edit it, turn it on and off when I want to. Um, and then just that whole process of you know, when you're waiting for your order to come, you're getting those text messages, your order's on its way, you're not, you know, wondering where it's at. And then 
actually like getting that to your doorstep, um, just making that a really seamless process to make sure, you know, people are feeling supported and not left wondering where their order is and want to keep coming back to that experience. I know I always find the same brands where I'm like, wow, that was seamless. I know how to even return with them. Like I'm going back to that company. I'm ordering from them over and over again because it can be, I mean, online shopping is almost too convenient, but it can be kind of a headache when you're, when it's not working how it's supposed to. Totally. Yeah. And I, I think it's also important to note how important it is to almost use all three of our solutions here. You know, you obviously need the seamless fulfillment to make that subscription program work, but you also need the data and the numbers um, to, to make sure what you're doing is actually impacting your bottom line. Um, so to kind of hop into numbers, uh, we're seeing that the cost of acquiring new customers can be almost five times as high um, than actually retaining your existing customers. Um, so I want to kind of jump into like, how do we make the most of that investment? You know, what are some of the tactics that uh, brands can use or some of the initiatives um, to extend that lifetime value without breaking the bank? So maybe, you know, learning a little bit more about like the loyalty program angle, you know, making subscriptions flexible, um, the data behind it. So Gina, uh, can you kick us off with some of those strategies and initiatives? Yeah, of course. I think one of the reasons that I love so, like getting customers on subscriptions, because even if they do cancel, you typically are able to run them through some type of survey. And that is like some of the most important information that you can get is like, why doesn't somebody want this product again? Because it gives you that direct feedback on what we have to do to fix it. Is it because they had too much? Is it because they actually didn't like the product? You know, most of the brands we see have multiple different products, especially like something like you know, different with different flavor profiles or different whatever, where if somebody just didn't like that one thing, that doesn't mean that they're not going to like other things from the brand. Um, so I think it is important that like, if you, you know, are watching that, even if you, some like your customers are on subscription, some aren't, make sure you have cancellation surveys in place because it's like mandatory that somebody will, I mean, yes, yeah, some people will go through other and whatnot, but you'll get some good feedback in there. Um, other tactics that I've seen people do is that when customers do churn, like, sending out or and by churn i mean like if somebody bought one time and then maybe they don't come back for three or four months and you're kind of wondering you know why didn't they come back sending out a survey to them offering some type of gift card if they did want to come back for them to take that survey can be really helpful because like you want to know why they didn't come back was it the product was it the taste was it because the shipping took too long was it because they didn't it's not what they expected um and i think to like managing expectation, especially around shipping and when it's going to get there really helps drive that holistic, good customer experience where somebody then starts to believe and, you know, build a relationship with your brand. Totally. Um, yeah, I think that's so important. Like surveys are sometimes one of the most underutilized tools. I think collecting, especially, you know, in this age of the zero party data um, and a lot of the restrictions on data privacy that we're seeing implemented all over the world. Like, you know, whenever you can collect that, that first person feedback, especially following an order, um, it's, it's so important. So Lindsay, I'm actually going to jump to you next because Obviously, fulfillment is part of that process, um, but there are some strategies that people can put in place to, for example, you know, trigger that email once a, a delivery has been delivered. Um, you know, what are some of the tactics and initiatives you're seeing some of our customers implement to 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 keep customers around longer to make them stay? Definitely. So it's like Gina said, building, I guess Gina Pirelli. I feel like in third grade when it's Gina E or Gina P sort of situation, but um, yeah, making sure that you're like really building and investing in the trust and loyalty of your customers. So there's a few ways to do that. Number one, what I already touched on, like making that experience really seamless to shop with your brand and setting up your supply chain to kind of work for you. It can be a huge headache when there's you don't know where orders are or they're an exception. So getting that foundation set up is totally like hugely important um, and taking it a step further with um, we have integrations with like Aftership, Gorgeous, Clavio, where you can actually take our fulfillment data and build custom tracking pages or um, send out automated tickets of your orders 10 stops away or your orders an exception because uh you know, there's a snowstorm in Chicago and we can't get it out in time um, and just really 
letting your customers know, giving them as much information as you can about where their order is that builds the trust and transparency with your brand. They're not left, you know, waiting a week, you know, where's my order? You don't know. They don't get a text. They're left in the dark. So um, I know I was thinking about this today where I was looking at my tabs open on my phone and they're all like UPS tracking pages because I had to go into my email and click on the tracking link and refresh the page. But that's like such a clunky experience and you can make it so much more streamlined with these custom tracking pages or order notifications or even enabling your customer support team at Gorgeous with this fulfillment data. So even your support teams are aware of where your order is, why it's on hold or if it'll get there you know, on time. Um, these two-day shipping expectations are pretty much here to stay, especially with Amazon, you know, changing the way people have expected their deliveries to come. And so you want to be able to meet those expectations and just really be able to support the folks that are shopping with your brand all along the way. I couldn't agree more. I also have like 20 uh, carrier tracking pages. And also, you know, one thing that we forget when you're using a carrier tracking page, you lose the ability to brand that experience. You lose the ability to, you know, have a link to maybe manage your subscription, to buy more products, to read reviews. Um, you know, tracking pages are also like a huge lever that brands can use to just improve that customer experience, especially post-purchase. Um, now, Erin, I'm going to hop over to you because I'm constantly blown away by the cool dashboards and data that Triple Whale can put together using all of these metrics. Um, so, you know, from a data perspective um, and just, you know, a tech perspective in general, what are some of those strategies and your and initiatives that you're seeing, you know, to really cement that retention um, and, and a lower costs overall because you're keeping customers longer? So definitely the, the dashboards are really helpful. Being able to actually like review the LTV metrics to kind of see where you sit with your customers. But I think really where you want to concentrate your time is more on like cohort analysis. So in your cohorts, you're really able to start segmenting your customers and then you can start actually creating those targeted emails, SMS marketing strategies that can now start significantly improving your campaign effectiveness by just tailoring your messaging more specific to the user and to those groups. Um, so, I mean, you girls have touched on it even today. Um, so one thing that could be um, is for inactive subscription cohorts. So segmenting those inactive subscribers and creating those personalized re-engagement campaigns that addresses the reasons for a disengagement. And also with those, you could be offering like certain incentives or even highlighting um, relevant content for that particular group. Another really great one too is also thinking of your new subscribers. So having a new subscriber cohort. So just optimizing those like welcome email series based on engagement metrics that to drive those desired actions, such as like when they're opening their emails or even what you know, content are they clicking on when they are opening those emails? Um, and then another really good one too is like an action-based cohort. So this one can be kind of looked at in a few different ways, but you're just really trying to um, trigger personalized emails based on specific customer actions. So like it could be either cart abandonment, um, it could be multiple product page visits, or even like if they're part of like a loyalty program or loyalty milestones. Um, you can really start utilizing that cohort analysis to then redefine those triggers based on those common behaviors within each of those groups. But then also, like I said, being able to personalize the content that you're going to be pushing out based on those cohorts and groups as well, too. That's, yeah, that's, that's so important. And I think looking at cohorted groups, you know, and segmenting your audiences in general is, is again, something that sometimes gets missed. We want to see, okay, how much am I bringing in this month, but understanding how much am I bringing in with, you know, new customers, you know, 18 to 25 year olds, et cetera, subscribers, um, you know, definitely something to, to keep in mind and, it's just so important to have a, a platform that allows you to to collect, curate, and interpret that data um, so you can constantly improve. On the topic of data, um, you know, 
how do you guys measure the success of customer loyalty initiatives? I know somebody in the chat mentioned loyalty programs as well, you know, but this obviously includes everything we've just talked about, the subscriptions, um, loyalty, um, you know, repeat business. What key metrics do you focus on to track improvements, you know, in customer lifetime value? Gina, I'm really curious uh, how stay at the AI helps customers do that and some of the features in your platform that that you know brings that that data to the surface. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like I have two kind of points to this is like one, like how do we know if it's working? So on loyalty programs, I think I've seen a lot of brands where they'll just see like, let's just say you have like points loyalty. They'll be like, okay, well, how many customers have points? And they're like, oh, like great, people are using it. And they don't realize that like a lot of people get opted into points where it's not like how many customers have points. It's how many customers are redeeming points. And that I think is like an important thing to look at because there's a lot of customer education that has to happen there. And like, I just think about like where I'm loyal to certain credit cards and airlines and stuff like that. It's because I really understand how to redeem the points with them because I know how it works. I feel like I'm kind of getting something back. I feel like I'm gaming the system a little bit. Um, so I do think it's an, it's important to look at are people actually using, you know, if you have something like that, how many people are taking advantage of it? Um, within Stay, we have a couple different things that we can do to help improve um, customer retention and, and loyalty. So one of like the most prime examples that I say every brand should figure out how to run when they first onboard with us is some type of free gift on order number two. Seeing and like you're a -B, definitely A-B test it. We don't want to just give away product if it's not actually working. Um, but with the experience engine within Stay, what you're able to do is just set up a quick A-B test. There should be something that um, even if you have to spin up a gift to do a small test of like 500, whether it, depending on your brand, a shaker bottle, um, koozies, a tote bag, a hat, whatever kind of fits your brand that maybe the cost is going to be under, you know, two, three dollars for you to, you know, produce and, and add it in dependent on your AOV. You want to kind of want to do like the math, like do the work back on it of like, okay, if our AOV is $50 and we like are just trying to get people to the second order and we can get a 30% increase if we were to send a gift, like how much do we want to spend on what that gift is and what makes sense? Um, but yeah, I would say like doing an AV test to know does a free gift on order number two actually help with retention? We've seen in most cases it does. Um, people get pretty excited about that, making sure that you're messaging that appropriately. But that's like usually my number one tip for brands that are experiencing high churn or, or want to do something around retention. Those are two amazing tips. It's funny because I feel like we don't hear that enough um, in a lot of our virtual content. And Personally, I couldn't agree more from the points perspective. Like I love brands that have loyalty programs where it's like, follow us on, you know, social media and get 200 points like that. I do those immediately because they're so easy. Leave a review. I mean, that's amazing. Re refer a friend. You can, you can easily tap into all of these little retention strategies through a points program, which again, yeah, it, it's, and then sometimes you can combine that with the free gift, right? I mean, I'm part of a diaper subscription program and I realized I had so many points, like I wound up like getting free toys, free diapers, you know, it's so important. And the free gift is so important, but definitely uh, think about what those costs look like. Um, we want this to help you, uh, you know, improve your margins. And, you know, from the fulfillment perspective, sometimes those picks do cost. Sometimes it's an extra bin of storage space as well. So be super strategic. And like Gina said, like maybe it's a product that you're already, that's already, you know, stocked in your warehouse, right? So you're not taking up additional space. You're not worrying about like printing something extra. Um, and it's also a great way to, to test your products and maybe keep that engine running where it's like, okay, you got this free, you know, um, moisturizer. What did you think? Um, and then keep that conversation going. Lindsay, what are, what are some of your tips and tricks? Yeah, from a fulfillment perspective, I mean, number of orders per shopper is a good one to focus on. Another trend to sort of keep an eye on is, you know, if people found you on a marketplace like Amazon or on Walmart, and then you're finding their second purchases on your website, um, that's a great like telltale sign that, you know, people found you, they loved the experience with you and came back for more and are now shopping directly with you on your like brand.com. 
Um, this is also a great time to shout out our integration with Triple Whale. Again, your dashboards just make it so easy to really overview um, certain trends and to be able to track your net profits. A big one is, you know, monitoring um, the shipping costs or like data for new and returning customers. So you can really easily compare on the overview and then really dive into the the data and see what's working for you. So I guess, Aaron, I can pass it over to you to see where else uh, you can dive into those numbers with Triple Whale. There are so many metrics that you could review. And honestly, the nice thing with Triple Whale is that everything's super customizable um, so that you could look at the metrics that are most important to your brand. Um, for today's discussion, I feel that some of the metrics that are gonna help you concentrate and measure customer loyalty um, are really going to focus on either customer behavior, once again, loyalty, and also profitability. Um, so one of them being obviously the customer lifetime value. So really this is like your corner store metric for assessing long-term value of customer relationships. And having an increase in lifetime value indicates that the loyalty initiatives are successfully encouraging customers to actually spend more over time. Um, another really good one is going to be your repeat purchase rate. So this is going to help you understand your customer loyalty. Obviously having like a higher repeat purchase rate suggests that customers are satisfied with your products or services and they're also more likely to continue purchasing from your brand. Um, another really important one too would be your customer retention rate. So once again, thinking about loyalty, thinking of subscriptions, um, this one will measure how well your business actually retains your customers over a specific period. So an improvement in this rate signifies that your loyalty programs are effective and that they're also keeping customers engaged and hopefully also reducing churn. Um, another one that would be really important is gonna be your net, um, your net promoter score. So your NPS actually provides valuable insights into customer satisfactions and loyalty by actually measuring the likelihood of customers recommending your brands to others. So having a really high NPS is indicative of a, a strong customer loyalty and can also lead to um, organic growth through just like word of mouth. Um, and then the last one, which I mean, no one wants to look at, but it's super important, is also going to be your churn rate. So monitoring your churn is just essential for identifying how many customers you're actually losing over time. And having a decrease in churn um, is going to be a really positive sign that your loyalty initiatives are actually working with your customers. Um, and then another like couple of our favorites just from on like on integration with ShipBob, for instance, um, is going to be like orders. So just being able to see how many orders are actually um, increasing over a certain amount of times and those orders being actually fulfilled as well too. And then from a subscription side, um, I also love the reactivated customers. So as we were kind of talking about again, like just how hard it is to acquire new customers, we also forget about the customers that have kind of fallen off, that have been inactive. So it also costs you less money to reactivate those customers. And that metric in our subscription integration is a really important one as well too. Those, yeah, I think, you know, you guys both touched on Gina and Aaron on, on churn, it is important, it's, you know, probably, you know, the less pleasant of the metric. Um, but knowing why customers leave, why they come back um, is really important. So looking at that then from, you know, the cohort, the, the group level, the big strategies, um, you know, we know one of the keys to, to a great shopper experience is feeling like they're, you know, customer is, is really being spoken to one-to-one -to -one. personalization is so important. Um, so what are some of the ways that brands can personalize their approach to customer retention um, without overcomplicating, right? Without, you know, trying to do a handwritten note in every package, um, you know, what are some of the strategies you're seeing work really well uh, with your brands? Gina, I will pass it off to you. Yeah. Um, I don't know why my camera just like had to zoom right into my face there. Um, <laughs> um, I would say like one of the like just low hanging group is like, again, I was talking about cancellation surveys before somebody cancels their subscription. We know why they canceled, like break those out. Even if it's like, if you have 10 different responses, you don't need 10 different flows, but like, think about just like, if somebody's like, Hey, I hated the product. It's like, okay, well maybe like they're not going to just reactivate. But if somebody's like, I have too much, and that's why they canceled their subscription. That's usually like the highest, like 
40% or more of why subscription cancellations happen, like for most of the brands I see, is because I have too much product, which is a total easy win to get them back. So putting those people in a flow where they're going to get an email or an SMS, like you're able to set that up in Clavia, we pass that piece back. So you're able to say like, you know, somebody canceled and reason is I have too much product, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, again, whatever makes the most sense for your product, send them some reminders. Hey, are you out? Like think, remind them of the product benefits. I think that's like the easiest segmentation, like something that every brand should absolutely be doing. Um, yeah, it's just that you've got the cancellation reason. You've got to just email these people and get them back on subscription when the time is right. Yeah, always uh, right message, medium, and time is so important. Um, and, and Lindsay, on, on your end, I know from a fulfillment perspective, uh, we do have some ways of automating, maybe not the handwritten notes, um, but what are some of the personalization metrics that you're seeing um, from our brands and maybe some tools that they're using uh, to make customers feel more loved? Yeah, definitely. And to Gina Pirelli's point, like, I see that all the time too, like with HelloFresh, where you see like boxes just lining the hallways and people haven't brought them in. So I think thinking about how to get ahead of that, it's crazy that it's like 40% of cancellations are because people have just ordered too much. So being able to re-engage after a time period when maybe they're like ready to meet with you again, like obviously if they set up a subscription, they like your product, but it just wasn't coming. And maybe that's like some user error too, like not knowing how often to set up your subscriptions or, you know, figuring out the balance of, you know, if you're subscribing to something and you haven't used it before, you don't know how much you're going to go through. So I think that's a really cool thing to touch on that I just wanted to re-highlight because I think that a lot of people probably have encountered a similar situation. Um, but from the fulfillment perspective, this one's kind of hard because fulfillment will like always be your biggest line item. But there's a top three that I was thinking about. Number one, this one would be not the most cost effective, but I think would have a huge impact is branded packaging. I know when things come, um, you know, in certain cool boxes or even if it's not an interesting box, but it's sustainable or some certain messaging that like really speaks to your brand. I think that can really set you apart. Um, I know I've even ordered from some people where I've like kept their packaging and use it like in my decor because I think it's cute. And so there's different ways that you can play with that from either making it super stylish or personalized in that way. Or um, I'm going to touch on a brand that I really like called Bowie, but they really highlight their sustainability with their branded packaging. Um, they highlight that it's decompostable, it's recyclable, um, and that's written on the packaging. And I think that, yeah, branded packaging is a huge way to stand out. Um, the second one, like Gina said, maybe not handwritten gifts, but if you, or notes, but if you work with the right 3PL, you can really automate um, gift notes or loyalty focused inserts. So this could help you increase loyalty by really making, we talk about it like, making getting a package from your brand, like getting a gift from a friend and making it just feel like a really fun, inviting experience. Um, it's also a good opportunity to help influence repeat purchases. So you could do like a subscribe and save insert, refer a friend sort of insert, 10% off your next order. So those can be really easy wins just in the fulfillment process. Um, yeah, Lauren, I see your note. It's called Bowie. We will, I'll highlight it. We have a slide in a minute. But um, the last aspect that Gina also touched on was, um, yeah, just building out your tech stack to really automate a lot of these for you. We also have a direct integration with Clavio to send, you know, personalized SMS or email updates um, about your order. This just really establishes more trust uh, in your brand to know, you know, you guys know what you're doing um, and just, yeah, create an, creating an experience that shoppers really want to return to. So I think all of those I've worked with, you know, and shopped with different companies over my uh, like years of online shopping. And I think those three things really stand out to me when I'm interacting with a brand. If their packaging is you know really on par and sets them apart, I wanna go back to that experience. Um, definitely emails and texts. So you're not like going into your, what I described earlier, like my purgatory of carrier tracking pages um, and just like getting those texts to my phone so I don't even have to go check. It's already like they're prompting me ahead of time. Um, and then, yeah, personalized gift notes or loyalty focus inserts. Those can be a really sort of passive ad if you um, work with your 3PL partner to build those flows of when to include inserts and when to not and to really automate 
that experience. So it's not taking up like, you know, some people who are fulfilling from their garage might be sending those personalized gift notes that are handwritten, but it's, as you continue to scale, that's definitely not sustainable. So really incorporating it into your whole, you know, overall model. Yeah, those are some awesome suggestions. I am such a big fan of new packaging ideas. I came across a brand that's actually like experimenting with like mushroom based packaging. So obviously completely natural, uh, just disintegrates into nothing. Um, we know packaging waste is one of the biggest uh, contributors to landfill pollution. So, um, and as a 3PL, uh, we are very aware of that and constantly looking for ways to just be more eco-friendly with our packaging. And we always encourage our merchants to think twice about it as well, especially when you can make it a branded experience. Erin, um, uh, from the triple whale side, how can we use the data to be more personalized? I just have to make a note. If there is a way of making the packaging into mushroom like based packaging, I would love to know if I could actually put that in my coffee. Because the one thing I've been loving so far is like taking the mushroom mixes and putting it into your coffee for like an extra kick. And so I would love to know. It's such a rage right now. Our I know. Expo West and the amount of like mushroom tea, mushroom coffee companies is just like, you know, Starbucks needs to jump on the bandwagon and all of these like coffee chains because, uh, you know, it's still a bit hard to get in coffee shops unless you go to kind of those like uh, boutique too cool for school coffee shops. But, you know, I feel you on the mushroom, the mushroom beverage. I can't, you can't really call it coffee or tea. I guess it's tea. I mean, I'm not sure, but I digress. Back to the data. <laughs> Back to the data. Yeah. So, um, it's really kind of a lot of stuff that we have touched on before. So utilizing customer data to provide those personal product recommendations, either on your website or in marketing emails or through social media ads. So this can really be achieved through algorithms that analyze the purchase history and also browsing behavior to enhance the either like shopping experience without having like a big success, uh, substantial cost. Um, another one that's also been like really touched on, which is honestly something that's super important um, is utilizing zero party data. So customer feedback is probably one of the lowest cost um, ways of actually being able to enhance personalization. So if you're able to regularly engage with your customers through uh, surveys um, or even like engaging with them through like social media um, or um, direct communication to gather feedback, um, this feedback will not only help to make improvements and show customers that their opinions are also, are also uh, truly valued. Um, I know a lot of brands like Avi is a really great one that really utilizes and has created this beautiful community and through any when there's a product launch um, if there's a new flavor that they're looking to do they reach out to their customers and guess what those new product launches they are the most successful because those things sell out like hotcakes because their customers were highly involved in that decision that was being made um, regardless of you know the taste of something they like or not the customers just want to try it because that was their flavor that they've chosen um, and then once again, like going back to also like, you know, you could do dynamic retargeting ads. So with Triple Whale, um, we can also help businesses create like dynamic retargeting ads that display products or offers relevance to the individuals previously interacting with that website. Um, and that will just ensure that customers are reminded of products that they were previously interested in. And then just helping to increase the likelihood of them actually making that purchase. Yeah, those, again, great tips. Um, for everyone in the audience, again, don't forget to add your questions uh, in the chat if you have any questions for any of these panelists. Um, we've already shouted out a few really cool brands that are, you know, doing doing great things uh, to promote customer loyalty. But um, I kind of want to share a few more examples. So I want to ask each of you, uh, you know, to share some of the brands that you think nail lifetime value, um, you know, lifetime value strategies and, and, and retention strategies, why you think they do it so well. Um, this could be a brand that you've worked with uh, professionally or, you know, a brand that you're shopping with, um, you know, or a brand that maybe you've seen um, an ad or experience somewhere uh, in the real world. So um, let's kick off some of those examples. Um, Gina? 
Yeah. Um, brands that absolutely crush at retention. Um, I will, I'm going to give a personal, um, clean skin club. So I've been a clean skin club subscriber for, I oh God, just since I lived in my old apartment, I've been in this apartment for five years. So like probably six years now. Um, and I like love the products recently. I've seen their ads where they are like, God, they, it's like a, it's skin, but then like a pimple is like growing out. There are these crazy TikTok ads where it's like showing all the bacteria that's on like a hand towel and like why you really should be using like disposable towels. Um, and I was already a customer, but after seeing those, I was like, I, I'm going to be using these for the rest of my life. Like, there's no way that I ever put a towel on my face ever again. Like, do I know if that's real? Like, do like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure it's a little bit exaggerated, but, um, I don't, they've just like built a product where like, you know, the cadence is right from when I've subscribed. I almost always get them like when I need them again, because it's a predictable one. Um, like I think like that coffee, like anything where you're kind of like using it at a regular basis, like I use them on my skin day and night. Um, and yeah, like I, I couldn't recommend this product enough. Um, another one that I think does really good uh, is a pup above. So they do a couple different types of uh, dog food, wet and dry. And I think there's four dry skews, four wet skews. Um, they started doing a custom bundle builder because they wanted like people were buying in bulk, obviously, especially when you're shipping, you know, wet dog food, anything that, you know, is wet or in a canner um, is heavier to ship. So you kind of need to ship it a lot of it at once. So they did these build your own bundle box where you got discounts, but you had to buy, you know, four products at once. Um, and for them, like that just like really increased. I think you had a ton of people who just were tired of paying really heavy shipping costs on it. And they've actually found that by putting more in each shipment and then shipping less frequently, their LTV jumped up. And I think that was just kind of a, a great case study for them and a good way to work around um, like some of the constraints that you see with D2C, especially when you have high shipping costs. I, I love any sort of dog brand recommendation. So I'm definitely going to check them out. And then, yeah, the Clean Skin Club, um, such a good reminder that face towels and pillows can just get so grimy. Um, so everyone needs to remember to definitely wash that at least once a week, if not more. Um, but uh, Lindsay, I'll pass it over to you to some brands that you think that uh, kill the LTV game. Sorry, on mute and controlling slides, but this is this uh, brand that I wanted to shout out earlier. Um, they have a really cool subscription model. Um, it's a sustainable skincare brand. Um, so part of their subscription is like Gina mentioned, where they're sending you new, a new toothbrush every month, um, a new scrubber, but um, to go in line with their sort of sustainability focus, um, they send you one package a year. So you aren't really getting overwhelmed by, um, you know, packages that keep coming and coming every month. So at checkout, you can tell them how often you swap out your toothbrush or your body scrubber. Um, and this also reduces, it reduces waste because you're not like shipping out a individual package every month, um, reduces emissions because they're just driving it to you, you know, your delivery once a year. Um, and they also do a sort of reverse subscription where you can send back your old products and they'll exchange it for a new one, which I think is really interesting. You don't see a lot of brands um, sort of being able to like ship back their product in exchange so that they're not ending up in the landfill. Um, and I just like love their packaging. I love how their whole brand is built on sustainability and they really like practice what they preach from how they operate their subscription model and loyalty programs um, to their packaging where they say right on the package like hey this is compostable um and it's by us and i you don't really just like see a lot of brands doing that so this is one of my favorites we work with a lot of um brands that do subscriptions there's one company called md acne which is a personalized another personalized skincare um subscription service and uh, Tom Brady's brand TB12. They have a really good like subscribe and save model. So you're getting new supplements or if you want to sub something out and try something new for the next month, they make it really easy to incorporate that into just like editing and staying flexible with your subscription. So this one's my favorite. And I see a note they offer recycling for their products. Um, does anyone, I guess while we're on the topic, does anyone have insights on closed loop sustainability programs for lifetime value? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one, but. 
I could jump in here because I know we work with some returns. Essentially, you need a returns processor different from a returns management tool. Um, you know, you can always reach out to us and we're happy to provide some referrals. But typically, you either do it in-house, a company like um, Boy or Boa, I'm never sure how to pronounce it. Um, I do think they do a lot of this in-house um, because it's part of their manufacturing model. Um, but depending on what type of products you sell, what type of raw materials you need and how you can recycle them, um, you know, there's there's partners that can do that. Um, but a lot of times, depending on the product, if it's part of already a part of the existing manufacturing cycle, a brand will take it back and do do the processing themselves. Um, and if that's the case, you know, maybe it's 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 as simple as using a returns management tool. Um, you know, something to note on the fulfillment 3PL side, like, you know, it's, it does get expensive depending on what your model is. If you send back a, a bunch of used toothbrushes to a ship off warehouse, like they're, they'll probably charge you extra to forward those to some sort of manufacturing plant or, you know, warehouse recycling place that can deal with that. Um, so you will have to work with an external provider just to get the cost down. Um, but in terms of, so I, I'm actually going to shout out a brand now, two brands. One is um, a ship up customer pet lab to go on the dog train again. Great dog vitamins, uh, different products. They always throw in free, something free to try. They have amazing incentives on subscriptions um, and I highly recommend them. But going back to the diaper brand I was talking about before, it's called Diaper spelled with a Y. And they actually have a take back program. So you can set up that you have to pay as a customer. I think it's $15 if you want them to come to your house every week and pick up all of your used diapers to then compost them. The diapers themselves are made of biodegradable materials. Um, I haven't opted for that service. I was very curious about it. But at the time, I was living in a New York City apartment and there was just no room to keep, you know, a week worth of dirty diapers. Um, so it really, you know, depends on the product that you're selling, the recycling process that is required to reprocess those items. Um, but I do think like, I mean, I, I give such props to to this company for doing that because you know products you know eventually especially products that are going to be thrown out or used and 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 then discarded afterwards i mean anything that we can do to get them out of of the you know waste cycle is obviously uh the best for the for our planet um but on that note, Erin, what are some of the brands you think are killing the, the LTV game? Um, well, actually, since we're on the topic of sustainability, I actually would like to go to Detox Market. It's, um, I think, a couple next one down. Yes, this one. So I was actually using this one as an example because they have a really great digital strategy. Um, and for those who don't know what digital means, it means the blending of physical and digital channels, often termed as digital. Um, and the reason why I actually admire the detox markets approach is their, their focus is on convenience and incentives. So they not only offer online purchases with in-store pickup, but they also have a bottles return program for rewards. So personally, like I have noticed that this program not only helps with cusp, like with um, reducing the carbon footprint, but it also provides additional incentives. So I've actually gone in a bunch of times to re return my empties and I have been able to repurchase many of my products and any women here that know about their, you know, when it comes to buying their makeup and their beauty regime, you're buying products all the time. So the fact that I have a program that like I can actually actively recycle my products um, and get incentives in return. And then I'm also rebuying from them. And I honestly haven't rebought from anybody else because A, they carry all my favorite brands, but I'm also constantly getting rewards from doing my part of recycling the products. So I just think it was a really, really, really smart program to like not only just help with the sustainability, carbon footprint side of things, but then also the loyalty program because I've just become a nonstop repeat uh, customer with theirs. 
Um, and then once again, just a really great blend with that digital strategy. So just having that physical and also digital channels coming to as one. Um, so there is that one on the sustainable side. And then if you don't mind going back to sheer text, sorry, I'm making you go all over the place. <laughs> so this one I absolutely love because I'm sure everyone here has seen their ads everywhere, but that's not really why, you know, I feel is the biggest noteworthy. I find that they just have a really deep understanding of a real problem and how they actually market their solution. So living in Canada, especially during the colder months, I wear a lot of tights, yet I honestly have never thought about researching a pair that could withstand everyday wear. Um, and Sheer Tuck is really to change that for me. Their ads consistently emphasize durability. And as someone who's tried, um, who's honestly really tired of replacing tights after one wear, I really do appreciate that. And while their tights are more durable, they also come with a higher price tag. So I do find that SureTax also does an excellent job of actually educating their consumers on why it's actually worth the extra dollar. So once again, like actually having to reduce the amount of times that you're having to replace them, so reducing waste. Um, and then also they understand that with some customers, they might need that extra nudge because of that price point. And that's why they do occasionally offer those really huge sales with those limited time offers. So creating a sense of urgency um that not only convinces customers to actually try their products but then also leads them to buy multiple purchases at once so really just feeling that SureTex kind of stands out for not just their quality of product but also their savvy marketing approach that really addresses those consumer those consumer needs and concerns and then ultimately driving both brand awareness and sales Awesome. I think those are some great suggestions. I love Detox Market myself. They have a great store in New York City. Um, and also PSA, Sephora is now taking any sort of used makeup, beauty product packages, packaging. You can kind of dump them all in a box near the uh, cash registers and they're using it to make like bricks and, you know, flooring and things like that. Um, cool. So, we have a few more questions. Um, again, we are wrapping up in a little under 10 minutes. So if you have a question for anybody on this panel, ask it now or forever hold your peace. Um, Gina, my first question is for you. Um, you know, I think a common theme in this whole kind of panel has been subscriptions, how important they are. Um, and, you know, we kind of talked about, um, you know, the sending too much product, managing the right expectations around it. Um, I think that stat with 40% of all cancellations being too much product, um, you know, how, how do we mitigate, how do we balance subscriptions on behalf of our customers? Because we know that we're all dealing with so many subscriptions. How can we be more proactive um, and maybe use some tools uh, to just help keep customers uh, balance in, in their current product, uh, you know, load yeah. and also, you know, keep them from churning. Yeah. I mean, I think like one of the most underrated things is actually in the setup where like whatever your default on your PVP is like, just use some common sense on that one based on the product. I think that there's a lot of brands that just like default to a monthly or a 30 day cadence. Cause they're like, Oh, everything should just be a monthly subscription. And like, that's it. And it's predictable revenue and whatever. But if your product, like I, um, I, I use like skincare all from the same company and I have a lot of products with them. They're all in different subscription cadences because I use them differently. And a great example is I go to reach for my nighttime moisturizer this week and I'm like, oh no, it's like almost out. And like, lo and behold, the next morning I get hit with a, your order's about to ship. And I was like, because I've been with this company for so long, I know that five months, and that sounds crazy, like every five months, but I know that my nighttime moisturizer, like five months is the right cadence for that. And like the retinol is like six months or every six months. And, but it's like, again, even though those are longer term subscriptions, the products last so long, like for me, I'm not going to unsubscribe because it's like on the right cadence. And it, when I first signed up for it, it was like every three months and I had to go in and make that adjustment. Um, but I just think brands like really be conscious of it. Don't just pick 30 days or one month because like you think that that's appropriate. If it is two months, like to use a product or like I just said, if you have skincare and you know that even if somebody uses this every day, they're probably going to take three, four, maybe five months to go through it. Have those options available so that people can find the right cadence for them. 
That's that's a great call out. Um, I just remembered another great subscription company I have is Drops. Um, I was on my last pod of dishwashing uh, detergent. And yeah, next day I have a box for the next 90 days. I go for a 90 day. And it's just like you totally forget. And I've been a subscriber of Drops probably five years now. Um, and it definitely took some time on my part to figure out what that right cadence was. My fabric softeners are, are a bit, you know, longer than my detergent. Um, but that's a, that's a great call out. Um, and then Aaron, last question for you, last question of the day. Um, you know, I know we, we talked about customer segments and, and personalization and, and really how every customer is different and how they use products are different. Um, what are, you know, and obviously what works for some customer segments doesn't always work for others. What advice do you give brands for identifying different levels of loyalty incentives for different customer segments? So like, how would you go about first identifying those segments and then matching those with relatable incentives? I think using the two Gina's right here with us today is a perfect example. Both of you just talked about two different products requiring two different types of subscription models. And I think it just always comes down to personalization and just making sure that you're ta tailoring everything for each segment group. So to really create an effective loyalty program for different customer groups, businesses should really first categorize their customers based on different factors. And that could be like behavior, um, value, buying preferences, um, and then by analyzing data on purchases, engagements, feedbacks, cus cus like companies can start identifying various loyalty levels uh, from new shoppers all the way to devoted fans. And then being able to tailor loyalty plans that are developed for each group using those personalization and communication, and then also technology will also help to increase efficiency. So. I think that once the first thing you definitely need to do is like understand those cohorts, segment those groups properly, and then from there start tailoring the loyalty uh, plans based on uh, those segments. And then from there, you need to continuously evaluate and then adapt based on the performance and the customer input, which is going to be super essential for these programs to succeed. Um, and then also this will approach will ensure that loyalty initiatives are engaging and they're relevant for each customer segment, and then also improving intention and value over time. That is an amazing way to close out this presentation today, this panel. Um, I want to thank my guests so much for taking an hour out of their day. Uh, Gina, Aaron, Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for sticking with us um, for the past hour. Um, the recordings will be available soon. Um, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, if you want to get connected with any of the speakers. Um, and we'll see you at the next one. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone.